Good morning. Thank you for joining us today for Blooms on the Horizon, 26 new additions to 2024. Um, we're excited to share with you the plants that we've added to our lineup this year and the reasons why they were chosen. My name is Jamie Heflin, and I'll be your host for today's webinar. So before we get started, I'd like to review just a few housekeeping items. This is a webinar, so your camera and microphone have been disabled. If you have a question at any point during the presentation, please go ahead and type it into the Q&A box. We will be answering questions periodically throughout the webinar, um, as well as at the end of the presentation. Uh, we will have a couple of polls pop up um, during the webinar. These are anonymous, just fun little things that we've thrown in there to get your feedback on what we're talking about. And this webinar is being recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel um, in very early spring. All right, so our presenters for today's webinar are Sales and Operations Manager, Nikki Moline, and Product Manager, Shannon McInerney. Nikki has been with Midwest Ground Covers for over 15 years and truly embodies the Midwest fundamental of being a lifelong learner. As sales and operations manager, Nikki leads the sales, shipping, and order fulfillment, order fulfillment teams here at Midwest Ground Covers. Shannon is going into her 10th year at Midwest Ground Covers, and she is continually demonstrating her passion for quality in everything that she touches. As product manager, Shannon oversees purchasing, product line development, and the plant accession and trial process. She also coordinates work in our extensive display gardens. Over the past few years, Nikki and Shannon have shared their passion for plants in a number of webinars. So if you hadn't had your fill of plants after today's presentation, be sure to check out our YouTube channel where you can find recordings from all of our previous webinars. And with that, I will have Shannon uh, get started with our newest ground cover. All right, thank you for joining us today, everyone. So yes, like Jamie said, um, we have quite a few plants to get over, go over, so we'll jump right in. So our first plant is a Juga Pink Lightning, and this is going to be part of our Hocus Pocus ground covers and premium pint ground covers line um, in, our, in our 10 flat pint pots. Um, so we really liked this one. You know, we're always looking for a Juga that are a little bit different than kind of the standards out there, the burgundy glow, um, the, you know, the purple blooming ones, things like that. So um, we've tried some variegated ones in the past and have found kind of a combination of the variegation wasn't stable or it, this, some of the hardiness was an issue. So this we've had in our trial houses for several years now. It's made it through a, one, at least one for sure, but I believe two winters. Um, and so it's been a, you know, uh, hardiness doesn't seem, seem to be a concern on this one. And the variegation also does seem pretty stable. It's not the most heavily variegated ajuga or leaf, but, you know, still some nice contrast between the lighter green color and the white margins. Um, and then the other nice thing about it is the flower color is a little bit different. So that pink flower, um, different than the blues and purples we typically see. So otherwise, it's going to kind of be you know, the same reliable Ajuga performer, um, you know, nice low spreading ground cover, part sun to uh, part sun to shade. Um, I think definitely you'll probably get a little bit better flower and variegation uh, color in part shade rather than full shade. Um, and then the nice thing about Ajuga, I think the, the question we always get asked about plants in these types of webinars are, what is deer and rabbit resistant? And this one is both. So um, nice thing about that as well. And we do have these, we had some available uh, last fall, so they'll be available first thing in spring. All right, uh, the next one is also an addition to our Hocus Pocus line in the 10 flat paint uh, pots and another variegated ground cover. So um, we must have really been into the variegation, the variegated leaves when we were uh, deciding what to add to the product line for 2024. Um, but this was another one that we had in our trial houses for quite some time. 
um, we're watching anything with variegation. We're always like a little bit skeptical. Is it going to revert? Is it going to perform as well um, as just kind of like the gr straight green leaved species? Um, but this one also performed very, very well. Fast grower, Thymus high ho silver. What's really cool about this one too um, is like other times it's edible. So if you look it up online, actually um, most stuff that comes up is about it being edible and, and using it um, in a culinary setting, but it's also a great ground cover. So um, grows um, pretty nice and quickly, fills in nice, um, eight to 12 inches tall and wide. So it stays pretty low to the ground and it gets really nice pink flowers um, as well. So, and the foliage is pretty highly um, variegated. So it looks really interesting. Um, just a really nice, you know, time ground cover. Uh, one thing I will say is with most times they do need drier soils. This is a plant that gets really sensitive if the crown of the plant gets wet. Uh, so make sure that you have it in a nice well-drained soil and um, it's not going to sit in any water. Um, we have found this one to be fine hardy by us. So zones five to 10. Um, so, you know, another ground cover to try out and it is available um, now. So you can pick it up first thing in spring. Oh, we have a poll for you. Okay, so we're only adding two ground covers uh, for 2024, and we like to know uh, what you guys are actually excited about, what we're showing you today. Helps us make decisions down the line. So um, out of Ajuga Pink Lightning and Hi-Ho Silver, um, which one sounded the best? Um, and one thing to add while, while everyone's vote, oh, everyone voted already, our Timus Hi Ho Silver seems to be the big winner. Um, but one thing to add about our uh, the ground cover line, or I guess adding new things to the ground cover line, while we like to do it and like to keep it fresh, I think, you know, there's not a flux of maybe new ground covers, like there are some other plants. So when we're adding a new ground cover, it is one that has definitely per performed well for us and we're we do feel really good about how it's going to do um you know obviously some of the perennials and shrubs have more constant introductions but um these not a two lot of really, ground cover breathing yeah, going yeah. On out there. <laughs> so the, these two definitely impressed us over uh, the course of a few years in our trial houses so all right um so we're going to move on to natives next and I think we kind of have a theme between the time and a couple of these natives where um, you kind of aromatic plants. So, you know, you can like investigate tea making and stuff like that after this webinar as well. Um, so first up, we have Agastache funiculum um, or Anis hyssop. Uh, so like other Agastache, this will kind of be like a licorice or minty scented um, to some degree plant. So this is just in our Midwest natives line. Um, it is not eco local ecotype like plants in our natural garden natives uh, product line. And that's partially um, where this plant is native to. So it's really more um, kind of north of us. So uh, North Dakota, Minnesota, upper Wisconsin is really like the primary native range for this plant. Um, it is pretty similar to Agastache. I'm going to totally uh, Scrofulera folii, which we do carry in our natural garden native line. That uh, the native range for that plant is a little more Illinois and East. Um, and in general, these two plants are pretty similar. There's a slight difference to the color of the calyxes under uh, the flower where um, Scrofulera folii is green and this one is a little bit more blue and then um the undersides of the leaves there's a little bit of a difference too so you can tell the difference between the two plants but in terms of flower and height and performance and things like that they are pretty similar um and so this is a clump forming plant it will spread slowly by rhizomes but also will do some self-seeding um as with a lot of agastache, it does tolerate the dry soils pretty well. Um, it's going to do best in full sun, but can tolerate some part shade. And it is a it is a pretty long bloomer. So that's one of the nice things is you'll get, you know, maybe like an eight week bloom time. Um, deadheading will help keep encouraging flowers to come. Um, so it is a nice pollinator garden plant. But then, as I mentioned, uh, with the, those aromatic leaves, 
It could also be used in a herb garden. A lot of the information you find about this plant relates to that as well. Um, so it can be used in an herb garden for teas um, and jellies or be dried for things like potpourri. So kind of a fun thing there. Um, it does, again, for the pollinators, it is attractive to bees, hummingbirds. It's a really good nectar plant. Um, so good for those things as well. And then again, um, with that aromatic foliage, the deer do not like it. So um, this one we are expecting to have available in May of this year. All right, uh, the next plant is Asclepius solvantii. solvantii. Um, and if you're looking at that, you're probably like, wow, that looks just like Asclepius syriaca. Uh, they are very similar, um, but they do have their differences. So solvantii is actually going to be less aggressive than syriaca. It does not seed quite as heavily. Uh, so if you wanted maybe a little bit better behaved Asclepius, that's um, a, a host plant for monarchs, um, this one might be nice to try, you know, in more of a landscape setting. Um, we are carrying this one in our Midwest native line. It, it's not local ecotype. Um, we haven't been able to find a seed source yet um, for a local ecotype, type, although we are looking. Um, but for now, we're carrying this in our Midwest native line. So um, the other difference with this is the flower heads are just slightly smaller um, and the pink is a little bit more consistent. You see more color variation with Syriaca. This one, um, the color is actually going to be more consistent from plant to plant. Um, like Asclepius uh, Syriaca, this one also develops a pretty deep tap tap root. So um, just make sure that wherever you're choosing to site it, it's going to be its long-term home because um, this plant can be really difficult to transplant once established. Now with that deep tap root, it does make it really drought tolerant. Um, so really good plant, um, you know, if we're going through dry spells, but also can handle um, wetter soils as well. So again, you know, maybe a mid range for a rain garden, um, you know, good plant for that. Um, gets three to four feet tall, 18 to 24 inches wide, full sun, very hardy, um, and an excellent pollinator plant. One smaller thing to note with this one, it will actually very easily hybridize with Syriaca. So um, if you don't want that, if you want to keep the plants pure, um, make sure that they're planted pretty far away from each other because bees will actually carry pollen um, from the plants and cross pollinate and make uh, hybrids, which is fun, but uh, maybe you don't want that. So anyway, um, we should have this one available in spring of 2024. So the next up we have Pycnanthemum muticum, which is another aromatic plant. Uh, the common name is mountain mint. So something interesting that I guess I never really thought about or realized, um, you know, we sell a few different uh, species of pycnanthemum and all of them are variations on the common name mountain mint, but none of them are actually like alpine plants. They are all um, more, you know, meadow type plants or maybe low woodland or or upland plants. So um, not sure how they got that common name of mountain mint, but they are not really for the mountains. They're, they're better served in our region. Um, so this variety um, that, you know, all the pycnanthemum have kind of slight variations on uh, either the flower or the foliage. So this one I think is really nice. The flowers themselves are not all that showy. You can see they kind of, it, it's a cool texture with that kind of flat topped uh, uh, dome. Um, very kind of light, lightly I guess, flowering uh, white flowers around the edges there, but it's those white bracts underneath the flower heads that really add a lot of the interest to the plants. Um, just because the flowers aren't super showy doesn't mean that they are not attractive to pollinators. They are super attractive to pollinators, all kinds of insects, uh, bees, wasps, butterflies, all kinds of uh, Pollinators love them. Typically when they're in bloom later in the season, they're just one of those plants that's buzzing with activity. You just walk by and you hear the buzz of all the pollinators on it. Um, 
this plant is going to do best in a kind of moist or medium, medium well-drained soil. Um, it cannot tolerate the dry as well as some of the other varieties of pygnanthemum can, so keep that in mind. Um, it is a vigorous plant. It will spread by rhizomes. It's definitely one that you have to keep an eye on if you're not looking to let it, you know, get get going. Um, but one thing that can help with that is early in spring to just kind of take a spade around the edge of the plant and do some root pruning, and that will help keep it in check a bit more throughout the season. Um, and so, like I said, that this, you know, obviously in the mint family, it's an aromatic. Um, so it's got that spearmint smell and the leaves can be used in things like teas. So um, all kinds of fun aromatics today. And uh, this one is available now. All right. Uh, the next one, I will say we watched in our trial gardens for quite a long time. Um, there was a lot of encouragement to carry it. But we were kind of like, all right, what is this plant? It, it was it was very interesting at first, and we weren't sure where it fit. Um, so Symphor trichum Aerocoides snow flurry. So if you're familiar with Aster Aerocoides, it tends to be a pretty big plant. It can get to be about three to four feet tall and wide. And so when we heard this one was an Aerocoides, we we're like, okay, this is pretty interesting. It is a ground cover aster, truly. I mean, we've had it in our trial garden. Uh, for a number of years, a lot of us, when it was first planted, thought it was a juniper when it's not flowering because it, it has like this really cool texture, actually juniper-like foliage. Um, but then in the fall, just gets completely covered with these beautiful white dainty flowers. Um, another pollinator plant, just again, covered in bees in the fall. Um, really, really interesting plant, not like anything that I think we've seen before. Um, we are adding it to our American Beauty native plant line, so it'll be um, available in number ones. Um, and we actually have some available now. But the nice thing about this plant is it does really well in dry soils, um, tolerates drought, probably wouldn't do the best in really wet conditions, but um, if you have a drier site, um, it'll do really well for you. Um, and again, it's nice that it's kind of a late season pollinator plant, because um, that's you know really important thing. It is also deer resistant, so that's an added bonus, but um, really cool plant. We've been um, really happy with it in the trial garden. And that picture on the upper right there, um, that's actually from our trial gardens and you can see how it really filled in. Um, I'm not sure how many plants that was, Shannon, if you remember, was it three? three yeah. Yeah, so it, it fills in real nicely. Um, so if you have a spot that you're looking to, to really cover, um, try some very trichum Aerocoides snow flurry. Um, we're gonna do another poll here. So please let us know what native plant you're most excited about. And I wanted to remind you guys, if you have any questions for us, you can go ahead and throw those in the Q&A. Um, Shannon and I will either type you back or we'll, you know, if we feel like it's a good question for everybody, we'll answer it here live. So if you have any questions, please let us know as we go through the presentation. Yeah. And one, uh, oh, everyone's oh. excited about snow flurry. Very excited. So <laughs> one other thing I was going to mention that would be a great use for, for snow flurry is um, I was attending a perennial plant association landscape design webinar uh, at the end of last year, and someone had used it on like at the edge of a retaining wall. So it was kind of right on the edge and draped over, and it looked really cool and really beautiful. And so you kind of had that juniper effect through the you know earlier season and then the flowers in fall. So neat idea for that. Wow. All right. Um, so we are going to go on to our perennials. So the first perennial we have is Hugera ball gown. And if you've attended these webinars the past few years, I, th I think we've maybe talked about a chartreuse Hugera um, in each of them. And so that's somewhat due to changes uh, in the PW product line and, and as they add and drop things. Um, but this is one that we've had in our trial garden a few years now, and we are feeling, I think, really confident about um, just having it. it we were like always on a mission to find the best chartreuse cucara, um, the the best performer for the landscape. And I, I think maybe we got it this time. So I will say we were also looking at pistachio ambrosia. That one was really nice, too. Um, 
but this one we just felt that you know the size was nice the foliage was nice kind of that nice ruffle to it um the habit not too tall but kind of a nice spreading habit um and the location we have it in i would say is kind of it gets some afternoon sun too but probably more morning sun a little more shaded in the afternoon um and it did really nicely there so I I think we probably still would like to try it. You know, everyone always wants to know what heuchera is going to do the best in full sun. And a lot of times they just tend to burn. Um, so maybe that's one thing we'll still investigate. But this one has performed really well in the landscape for us. Um, as with most heuchera, it's still going to need good drainage. Um, but it, on, the con on the converse side of that, with the drought last year, you know, we don't have irrigation in our trial beds. We do occasionally water supplementally, but I would say um, of all the gardens, the trial garden is probably one of the last to get supplemental water. And this one did, you know, well through the drought. It didn't really look too, too ratty uh, towards the end of the season like they sometimes can. So definitely a good one to check out if you are one of those people that's on a mission for a good chartreuse heuchera. And uh, this one we will have available, you know, as soon as the weather cooperates. Um, we have a couple quick questions on snow flurry. So does snow flurry seed? I am not, it's so low to the ground. I feel like even if it did, it's just kind of spreading yeah. in its own area. So I have a, I have a, you know, I'm willing to bet that it probably does. Um, yeah. But with the rhizome spreading too, I think if it is, um, you know, it's kind of mixed in that. It's not, we haven't seen it popping up in other places. And again, right. that yeah. it's been in the trial garden um, <clears throat> for it, probably at least four years now. So, yeah. Um, the other question is salt tolerance on snow flurry. Um, we do not actively salt here at our property. So that's not something we've trialed. I don't know, Shannon, if you've heard anything. I haven't. Um, no. So I would just say uh, in general, if the, I don't, I can't remember off the top of my head, if the straight species of Ericoides, if that does okay with salt tolerance, but I would yeah. say it would be similar to that. And we do have, if you go into our plant library on the website, it will tell you um, salt tolerance on plants. That is one of the categories. So you can take a look at that. All right. Uh, next plant, heuchera smoke and mirrors. So this is another new heuchera that we've trialed, watched over time, and we're really impressed with. Um, we made a decision to drop silver gumdrops, um, which was a proven winner. This is not a proven winner. Um, silver gumdrop, we really loved the way the leaf looked, but it wasn't quite vigorous. It stayed pretty small. Um, and you know, over time we were just kind of like, okay, we need to find another one. We loved the look, but needed to find a different version. So smoke and mirrors doesn't get quite as silvery as silver gumdrops, but still has this really beautiful silver overlay on the leaves um, with some darker venation. I think um, that's also a difference between what you may have seen on silver gumdrops. Um, the other thing that I think is a little bit more superior here with smoke and mirrors is it um, seems to perform better under very hot and humid conditions, which not all heuchera do, some melt um, when it gets to be, you know, really the peak of summer. So um, I think this one also tends to be a little bit better there. This plant also gets really pretty flowers, so pretty floriferous for a heuchera. Um, you know, and if you're into that, I'm not a huge like flower heuchera person. I tend to cut mine off because I like the foliage, um, but some people like it. So they do get a um, pretty heavy set of those nice pink flowers. Uh, so a smaller heuchera, eight to 10 inches tall, 14 to 16 inches wide, uh, good for part sun to shade. Um, I don't think we've trialed this one in full, full sun. Yeah, we haven't. So, um, but I would err on with that silver overlay to at least give it a little bit of shade. Um, and this one is available now. So we'll be carrying it in a, a number one container. Next up, we have hibiscus Valentine's crush. Ooh, we hooked. Okay. Um, so this variety is going to be a replacement for cranberry crush, if you're familiar with that. And, um, 
Cranberry Crush w was a really nice plant in and of itself. I think of the original varieties in the Summerific line, it was definitely the best performer of the bunch. Um, but they've just kind of made a few upgrades, so to speak, on that. Um, I will say, if you are a fan of Cranberry Crush, we do still have some left, but kind of when they're gone, they're gone. So if if you're a diehard on Cranberry Crush, get them this year. But um, so Valentine's Crush is going to have a brighter red flower um, where Cranberry Crush was maybe a little more on the darker red maroon side. Um, but the other thing about this is you can see in that bottom picture, it's like a nice flat open flower where Cranberry Crush was a little bit more cupped. It's like those flowers never really got fully open. Um, so these are much flatter, which just obviously makes the flower look bigger um, and cover more surface area of the plant. Um, and so then the other differences between this and Cranberry Crush are the habit just a bit. Um, so this is going to be just a little bit narrower. You can see there three to four feet. Um, so Cranberry Crush really was more like four to six feet tall and wide, where this is just a bit narrower. So maybe if you have a slightly tighter space, this will fit in there better. Um, you know, again, typical hibiscus type type situation where this is going to want um, moist, to, to moist, well-drained to more moist soil. It needs some drainage, but it can handle the wetter conditions better um, in the drier times. This might not do as well. Although, again, we have uh, several different varieties of the summer effect series in our, in our display gardens. And Overall, they did just fine through the drought last year. It's not like we saw any major, you know, issues with them. Um, so, yes, this one is available now, and it will be in a number two proven winners can take. All right. The next one's Perovskia denim and lace. This is another proven winner um, perennial. And this was another one I feel like we dragged our feet a little bit on adding it. Um, of course, <laughs> Proven Winners was encouraging us. Uh, it was the 2020 Proven Winner Plant of the Year. And we were kind of like, okay, do we add another Perovskia? We had quite a few. Um, but after seeing it at Walters and then trialing it ourselves, we were like, you know, this is a better plant. Um, similar to Little Spire, so similar size. Um, but the differences you're going to see, this one, actually, the stems are much stronger. It stays more of that vase shape, very upright. The flower set is closer together, too, on the on the branches. So, you know, at the top of the plant just looks more of this, like, robust, purpley blue rather than, like, you know, little spire tends to get kind of that gray blue. So I would say the, the flower color overall is um, a bit more... Um, you know, intense on this plant. So main differences, really uprights, more intense flower color, really good for hot, dry locations, just like all the other Perovskia, um, and going to get about two to three feet tall, which is the same as Little Spire. So if you're looking to change things up and, and you know, looking for a replacement for, for Little Spire and want to try something new, I'd give this one a shot. So we should have this one in May, um, and we'll be carrying it in a number one. All right, next we have Flax Paniculata Backlight. Um, so this is actually the first of four Flax Paniculata we're gonna talk about, and they are all part of the Luminary series from Proven Winners. Um, this was another one where I think we got trials of these plants probably, uh, I don't know, a handful of years ago, and weren't really looking to make any changes to our Flax line and then Kind of after we saw how they performed, especially we we saw them in the gardens a, a, a few years in a, grow, a row up at Walter's Gardens, we decided it probably really was worthwhile to make some changes um, to some of the older uh, varieties that we carry. So backlight is um, a pure white flower. So this is going to be um, what we are replacing Flex David with. And it really just is a, a nicer habit, cleaner foliage. Um, probably a little bit shorter than David was, you know, that could get pretty tall at times, three to four feet, where this is going to stay just under that uh, around 30 inches or so. Um, this is the narrowest plant of the bunch. So most of the rest of the varieties we're going to talk about are a 
pretty rounded size where this is maybe just a little bit taller than it is wide. Um, <clears throat> again, typical flex cultural practices, it's gonna do best in full sun. Um, but again, this is, is shown to be much more disease resistant, much more powdery mildew resistant than the older varieties. Um, it has a dark, dark leaf, a little bit thicker, which typically helps with that disease resistance type stuff. Um, and so this variety is available now. And then next we are going to go to Flax paniculata opalescence as part of the series. So this is, you can see the pink flower with the darker pink eye. We're saying that this is a replacement for Laura, but it it's not really a direct replacement. You know, Laura was more of that lighter purple color where this is more pinky. So it's probably kind of the closest they have in the series to Laura, but if you're um, you know, really a purple person, maybe this isn't going to suit the bill. That being said, Nikki's going to talk about one in a minute. If you want purple, that's just like a total knockout. So um, again, same as backlight, good disease, disease resistance. This one is a little bit wider um, and a little bit taller than backlight was. And then Nikki is going to go to the next two. All right, next one, Sunset Coral. So this one's gonna have like a really intense kind of orangey pinky red color. Um, but again, like Shannon said, when we we went to Walters, we pretty much go every year and they were pushing us on these flocks for a while. And we were kind of like, oh, we're pretty happy with our flocks line. But I will say over time, I think what really won us over, like Shannon said, was the form. The form was so nice and consistent on these plants and the flower set, like they were so much more floriferous than the the flax we were carrying. So that's why eventually I think we decided to make um, the move. The other thing to note is with uh, Walter's trial gardens, if you've ever been up there, one of the things I'll tell you an issue they have is they irrigate very heavily up there, probably too much. Um, and we didn't see any powdery mildew on the flax at all. So that was another big selling point for us. And the, and their gardens are pretty, you know, they're planted pretty closely. So um, where airflow could be a potential issue. So um, sunset coral is gonna be a little bit on the taller side, um, can reach up to 32 inches tall and wide. So a little bit bigger of a flax, but again, like the others will perform best in full sun and we are looking to replace um, Glamour Girl with this, this variety. So again, that's Flock Sunset Coral if you're looking for like a hot pink orange kind of color. Um, and the purple that Shannon referenced, so ultraviolet. Uh, this one's really stunning. I'm a huge fan of the color purple. Um, so absolutely just very vibrant, kind of glows. Um, but this one, ultraviolet, will be our replacement for Phlox Nikki. I know my namesake Phlox is going away. I did buy some and planted it in my garden just for the memories. Um, <laughs> but this one's also going to be on the taller side. So um, 32 to 36 inches tall and wide, um, best in full sun. And again, so on, on these, they all have really similar characteristics. Some are a little taller than others, but it's really fall, um, flower color that's probably going to drive your decision making because um, they're all powdery mildew resistant, um, all really, really floriferous. Um, so really good flox, garden flocks performers. All right. And then the last perennial of this section um, is Vernonia Summer Swan Song. So this is an introduction from Chicago Lane Grows. And this was one that we had in the trial garden here in St. Charles for quite a bit of time. And another one that we were just kind of watching. We weren't sure, um, you know, it looked like it was going to get maybe a little bit on the bigger side. So we were like, oh, is it going to be a good fit for the product line? but we have been very, very impressed with this plant. So it is similar to iron butterfly, but it is a little bit on the bigger side, but sturdier stems. So what we notice on the plant is it maintains it's kind of like tight mound shape um, really well, no matter, you know, heavy rain, whatever it's faced with, um, really, really kind of, you know, that tight, tight um, mound. And very, very, again, 
floriferous. I feel like I'm going to say this word like 80 times today, but um, when it's in bloom in the fall, it's just completely covered with these beautiful little purple flowers. They kind of look like an up close um, Leatris flower, which is kind of interesting, uh, but it attracts lots of pollinators in the fall. So a great fall fall pollinator plants. Um, and one of the other things that Chicagoland Grows was doing with this breeding program was trying to watch for powdery mildew and rust, which can be a problem for this plant in the fall. Um, as many of us know, when the temperatures get cooler and the weather gets a little bit wetter, um, it's the perfect storm for more disease, which can happen in the fall. So we did see some really nice uh, disease resistance on this plant. So Really nice uniform plants um, if you want to try it out. I believe we are still carrying iron butterfly, um, right? No, we are dropping iron butterfly. So summer swan song will, will be um, the Veronia, Veronia um, for you to try. So, and we do have it available now. And I think with that, we're gonna do another poll. We are allowing you guys to choose multiple on this one. So if you had a few that you were really excited about, um, go ahead and, and, and vote for what you liked. And just to mention on the form for that Vernonia, so um, I think last year we talked about the asters from Chicagoland Grows, um, the billowing series, the billowing violet and billowing pink. That's like between the, those plants and these plants, that's one thing that Jim Alt, who retired from the Chicago Botanic Garden, did really well in his breeding is like that nice, compact, sturdy form. Mm -hmm. um, so like Nikki said, this Renonia is a good one to check out. And then if you haven't tried those asters, we love them and have talked about them a lot lately. Um, mm -hmm. So those are definitely another one to look at. All right, awesome. kind, of a, kind of a mix here, with, uh, which is, is good. That's nice to see that kind of there's a lot of interest in all the different varieties. So yeah, you right. guys won't be disappointed with the flax. I'm, I'm telling you. So. Mm -hmm. All right, so we are moving on to shrubs now, and our first variety is Aronia Lowscape Snowfire. Um, so this is a proven winner's variety, and it is going to be replacing Lowscape Hedger. Um, so if you're familiar with Hedger, that was kind of the more upright variety in the series. Um, this it was a little bit, you know, kind of tall and a, a bit narrower. This is going to be a little more rounded form overall. So about three to four feet wide, or sorry, three to four feet tall and wide. Um, but kind of the namesake for this plant uh, is, is the different characteristics it has. So the snow part of it is this plant is totally covered in white flowers um, in, in spring. So very heavy flower set of, uh, which is, you know, the snow name. Um, so then those flowers will turn into fruit. So with the heavy flower set, that leads to a nice heavy fruit load of um, blackish blue berries in fall. And then the fire part of the name is the fall color. So really brilliant, bright red, orange fall color. Um, so kind of attractive throughout the seasons from the flowers to the fruit to the fall color. Um, Aronia in general, I think are a really big problem solver plant right now for people. They are salt tolerant. They're generally drought tolerant. They uh, handle clay soils just fine. Um, and then with the fruits, there's interest for the, you know, food for the birds and things like that. So they're a really nice plant that serve a lot of purposes. Um, you will, you know, with most things that fruit, you're going to get your best flower and fruit set in full sun, but this can handle part shade as well. Um, and again, just a really nice consistent form. I realized I had a picture of this one from last summer that I didn't sneak in here, but it was just a nice rounded habit. So um, good kind of utilitarian plant to check out. And this one is available now. All right, the next one is kind of a oldie, but a goodie that we're we're bringing on back. So uh, Cornus Silver and Gold. So this plant has been around for a very long time. Um, I was actually, you know, I always refresh myself when we're getting ready for these presentations. And it's been around since the late 80s. Um, it was actually part of a very, um, an early 90s Mount Cuba trial. And it is actually an award winner of the, Steyer Award from the Pennsylvania Horticulture Society. So um, 
we planted this plant in our trial gardens. I don't know where we got it. It was one single we, plant. We got it in a trial pack from Mount Cuba. Oh, okay, great. So yeah. it's, it's, it was from a trial pack from Mount Cuba. And we planted it and we were kind of like, oh, okay, yellow twig cornice. We're like, okay, we'll see what it does. And it's been in our trial garden for a long time. And it just grew on us. The form on it was so nice. Um, the foliage stayed so clean. Um, it, some of the red twig dogwoods, like Asante, you know, there's some foliar issues with that plant, disease issues. Very clean foliage, not much reversion. I think maybe last year we had one stem that reverted. Maybe, I don't know, but like no reversion on this plant. So really strong performer, very stable variegation. Um, like other cornice, like red twig dogwoods, you'll want to go out every year and kind of cull out some of the older stems to kind of keep promoting new growth. That's where you get the most vibrant color for, you know, fall. This is a yellow twig dogwood again. Um, we'll spread by root suckers, but the plant that we've had, I mean, it stays really kind of nice where it is. It doesn't look like it's kind of taking over the garden or suckering everywhere. Um, so just kind of keeps its really nice form. Um, it does flower. The flowers are kind of insignificant, but we'll get some of the nice cornice white berries in the late summer. Um, and this plant is best in full sun to part shade. I believe our the place we have it planted in is mostly sun. Maybe gets a little bit of a little bit of shade, but we were really impressed and and we were not quick to add this plant. Like I said, it's been in our trial gardens for a really long time. So um, cornice silver and gold. Yes, just the fact that we got one plant. So, you know, we had to build up our our stock from this cuttings of this one plant. So, um, yeah, I think it's probably been at least seven or eight years that we've had it. Mm -hmm. We have a couple questions on the aronia. Um, folks are saying they have big problems with rabbits eating their aronia. So. Um, yes, they are. We they're delicious. Yeah, right. Yes. Uh they they are a plant that the rabbits will go for. Um here in our trial gardens, we haven't seen many issues or really any issues with them eating rabbits eating them. We do have them, but um we don't typically see rabbit issues with a whole lot of stuff, I think just from the diversity of things we have planted. Mm -hmm. So um yes, unfortunately, if if you're in an area that's really prone to rabbits, um it might take some fencing while they get established. I don't know if they even go for bigger plants. So it, it might not work in a situation like that. But for a lot of other situations, it does um, it does well. Oh, we've had them eat our nursery a lot in our nursery. Oh, well, and we, we don't have any issues with that. I think, um, like I said, just the diversity of what we have seems to yeah. keep. We don't notice too much significant rat, rabbit damage on any one plant. We have lots of delicious things, though. So right. We're like right. a salad bar over here. Right. So I don't right. know. <laughs> they take a little nibble from everything. Yeah. <laughs> um, next up, we have Dyer Villa Kodiak Fresh. So I imagine many of you are familiar with the Kodiak series from Proven Winners. Um, black, orange. There will actually be an improved red coming out next year. Um, but this is just an addition to that. So um, you can see here kind of char chartreuse foliage. So that new growth comes out as orange red um, and then turns uh, lime and chartreuse as the season goes on. I will say this probably is a bit better suited. It can take sun to shade. Probably its best lighting situation or best best color wise would be in part shade. Um, it does seem that when it's in full sun that it, it kind of, you know, instead of that nice chartreuse color, you get a really bright yellow color, almost a little uh, obnoxious of a color. Um, so for that ideal like chartreuse color, giving it some shade would probably be best. Um, and Dyer Villa, again, have been a really, you know, often talked about plant these days just because they do well in a lot of situations. Um, they are drought friendly. They can tolerate clay. And then they have the yellow flowers. This one, you know, flowers pretty consistently throughout the season. Um, but the yellow flowers, which are really nice for the pollinators. So form wise, um, just a nice, you know, smaller rounded shrub, two to three feet tall and wide. 
Um, so again, this is just another, um, you know, uh, nice characteristics to make it showy in the garden, but in general, a nice utilitarian plant. So, and uh, this one is also available now. All right, this next one I'm pretty excited about. Um, it, they showed us this plant a couple of years ago when we went to the Proven Winter Gold Key meeting. And it was probably one of the plants I was the most excited about. And I should have, I have a really um, close up picture of the flower, but it's really interesting um, uh, arborescence. So if you get really close to that green flower, they have this inflorescence near the center that's actually purple. It's really, really pretty. Um, and you don't have to get crazy close to the flower to actually see it, but it was really different to me and, and really pretty. Um, so hydrangea arborescence, obviously a very popular plant, Annabelle, um, Incredible. So this one's going to be called Invincible Sublime. So with this one, you're going to see um, those, those green kind of um, mop head flowers on very sturdy stems. Um, we saw this one in a garden up in Michigan, looked really nice, really nice form. And like I said, if you get close to that flower, it has this really pretty purple inflorescence going on. So really interesting, not like anything I've really seen before. Um, you know, like arborescents tend to be a pretty good plant for the garden. This one's going to get to be about two to three feet tall and wide, so not super tall, um, and can be used in full sun to part shade. Very cold, hardy um, zones, three to nine. Um, so like I said, just kind of really interesting plants. I was impressed by it. Um, with arborescence, uh, to kind of get the best form on it and the best flower set, you're going to want to prune this one back to about a third of the plants really early in the spring. They flower on new wood as a reminder. So um, that's how you'll encourage kind of, again, the best um, flower set and keep that plant nice and sturdy and strong. Um, oh, one thing to mention on this one too, just make sure you have it in a spot with good drainage. And that's the same with any hydrangea arborescence. All right, another hydrangea, I think, oh, no, we've got one after this. I was going to say, I thought that was the end of the hydrangea, but, um, you know, they're constantly coming out with new ones. So this variety is a cross between, or sorry, well, I should say this is hydrangea Let's Dance Skyview. So I'm um, part of the Proven Winners Let's Dance series. And this is a cross between uh, Macrophylla and Serrata hydrangea. So a Serrata hydrangea, um, some varieties you might know of, of that species are Tough Stuff or Tiny Tough Stuff, Tough Stuff Red. Um, so the important thing about serratas is they are a mountain hydrangea. They were found in the mountains of Japan. So they have some better bud cold hardiness than even the macrophyllas have, you know, even the, the improved macrophylla bud hardiness that has kind of started with the whole Endless Summer series. Um, so then those are the, the tough stuff series is more of like a lace cap flower. So then these were crossed, um, with a macrophylla to create that more mop head flower. So you get that bud cold hardiness of the serrata series with the nice big flower of the macrophyllas and also the repeat bloom that they've been able to develop on the macrophyllas. So, um, you will get, you know, more than just one bloom in a season. Uh, so Skyview, that was kind of a nod to the sky blue. This is one variety that is really relatively easy to turn blue. Obviously, if you plant this one in our native soils here in Illinois, it's going to be pink. Um, you can kind of see some pink flowers in the background there, but it's kind of like a, you know, a cotton candy pink, kind of the color of my sweatshirt here. Um, but if you use aluminum, you can get a really nice blue color on these. So that picture on the bottom, like the flower right right in almost the center of the picture, as the flowers start to develop, they have kind of a blue tinged edge with the green center. And then as they fully open, they get that nice sky blue color. So, um, you know, I think that's kind of the color everyone thinks about with the classic macrophylla hydrangea when you look at pictures from Cape Cod or something like that, like that nice light blue hydrangea, the old Nico blue. Um, and so this kind of accomplishes that. I know, again, the original summer was maybe in that range too, 
but this is going to be probably a little more compact plant and a little bit sturdier stems than that. So if that's the color you're going for, um, I would definitely look at Let's Dance Skyview. And uh, we do have those available now. Um, we have them in a number three, and then they're also available, will be available this spring in a number two in our Bud and Bloom program. All right, so you guys might have seen some press on this one. Uh, so this is a new first edition's introduction, Hydrangea Macrophylla Eclipse. Um, they're really excited about this one, and, and they should be. So it is a uh, macrophylla with dark purple foliage. And that foliage really, it's like a purpley black. So um, Shannon and I actually took a trip to Minnesota to their... Um, kind of like breeding fields where they have all their trials going on. And we saw this one a couple of years ago, I think two years ago. Um, they had a production area full of them in containers in full sun and the foliage looked amazing, just amazing. Um, so you might wonder, well, it's a macrophylla, why didn't it end up going into their endless summer line? The one thing, and maybe this is with how dark the foliage is, um, it isn't a rebloomer to the level of endless summer. So they have very specific um, specifications on why things go into endless summer versus first edition. So this didn't quite qualify to be an endless summer because the bloom just wasn't quite as heavy. But you will get a nice bloom on it. The flowers are this really kind of intense um, magenta pink color very, very pretty. Um, and, and the centers are kind of white. So the contrast on this plant is just really cool. Even if it's just a foliage plant, I think it's pretty attractive. Um, it will take more full sun. The color on the foliage will be more intense in full sun. If you put it in more shade, um, you will get more of a green purple foliage color. So definitely want to make sure you have it in um, more of a full sun situation. Um, the other thing with this plant is the hardiness zone. So it is hardy to zone five. Um, it was living up in Minnesota, but I guess they didn't feel fully comfortable with its hardiness, which is, again, another reason why it didn't get added to the endless summer collection. But should do fine for us um, here in Chicago or, you know, if you guys are in any of the lower Midwestern states here. Um, but I would definitely give it a try. So we are going to have it in our Bud and Bloom program um, for this year. And then we will add it to our regular product line as well. Yeah, talking with um, our our Virgil nursery manager, we should have some number threes available around midsummer. So. Awesome. Uh, all right, Hypericum, Cobalt, and Gold. Uh, so this is from the first editions program, and we were kind of um, spurred to add this plant partially because we, we right now we carry um, Blues Festival uh, Hypericum from Proven Winners, and they are actually discontinuing that plant. Um, but kind of around the time we found out that information, like Nikki said, we were up at Bailey's a couple years ago and we saw this plant in their um, display gardens there and it was a total knockout in terms of form. You can see in that top picture there, that was one of the photos I took and just like super nice branched, full, um, you know, really nice form Hypericum. I think I still have memories of like, the old Hypericum that were huge and leggy and like they would break all over the place. And this is not that just like an awesome form, still that nice blue green color. Um, and a, when they are blooming, they are covered in bloom. So we were there at the end of June. That was just kind of right before they were ready to bloom. I know we say, um, on here, late spring, early summer, you know, it's always like, what do you think of that? I think it's actually probably a bit later in that where we're talking, again, we were up in Minnesota, so maybe they were a bit later than us, but I think you're really looking at like that June, July bloom period, um, covered in yellow flowers, great for pollinators. Um, this is a plant that will be deer resistant. It is also very drought tolerant. Um, so again, kind of one of those nice utilitarian plants um, for something else in the landscape. So this we're expecting to have available in June of this year. Uh, we did get a quick question on the reblooming of Eclipse and it's not as big of a rebloomer as an endless summer. So you might get like some sporadic reblooming, but not, not a ton. So 
it'll kind of have one big flowering show and then a little bit, but not, not a ton. So mm -hmm. the, the really nice thing, and I think part of the reason they're excited about Eclipse too, is that dark foliage. Um, mm -hmm. We've seen other, we've gotten trials of other dark leaf hydrangea and typically they're dark you know, early in the season and then they turn green where this foliage does really stay that nice dark color yeah. through the season. So. It's, it's purple. All right. Uh, so we're pretty excited about this. We're adding a couple new rhododendrons. So we'll each talk about one. Uh, so rhododendron Delaware Valley White. So we did bring these into trial um, to just kind of see how they looked and, and and their hardiness. And we were really impressed with their, again, flower set, very, very floriferous. Um, and we wanted to add something different. We've been carrying, you know, PJM, Karen for a really long time, that kind of usual pink um, rhododendron, but we felt like it was time to bring on uh, some new colors, especially with our, you know, adjusting um, zone here in, in Illinois uh, with the new USDA map. So um, this one does get, again, the really nice white blooms on evergreen foliage. Um, we'll get to be about three to four feet tall and wide. Um, best in dappled sun to part shade. So we'll say probably a little bit of shade on this one is a good thing, um, but can take more uh, sun. And with like all rhododendrons, they do not like wet feet. I have made um, this mistake many times and have killed many rhododendrons because I plant them in soil that is too wet and then I get sad. Um, so make sure you're planting it in a drier location. Um, if you have an evergreen, you know, that's a good place to plant a roto because they like the acid and they like drier soil. So, you know, that's a kind of perfect uh, location for them. So we will have these available in um, March and again, hardiness zone five to eight. All right. So I know we are kind of quickly running out of time. So we'll just do this one really fast because most is the same as Nikki said. Um, but this is rhododendron Hino Crimson. Um, that picture, at least on my screen, looks maybe a little bit pinker than it actually it is. It is a really nice bright red Um so again, it doesn't want the wet feet, but the they can benefit from a little bit of mulch just to help retain some moisture. Um, and nice thing about rhododendron to go back to the rabbit thing is the rabbits typically don't tend to bother them. So that's a good plant if you have rabbit issues. And uh, again, with the white, we expect these available in March. So um, another rose. I feel like some roses are having a moment, some aren't, uh, but we're trying to refresh our rose line a little bit. So we have been bringing in more trials. We've been exploring the proven winter line of roses. And this was one that um, I think we we really liked. So we decided to add. So Rosa Oh So Easy Italian Ice. So really pretty plant gets these kind of like bicolor flowers, um, really intense pink with the kind of lemony center. Um, really nice, clean, glossy foliage, really nice form on the plant, disease resistant. We weren't seeing powdery mildew issues. Um, really nice kind of healthy shrub rose plant. So we did trial this one in production um, and we were really impressed by it. And the, and the flower color really is pretty impressive. Um, so if you guys want to give this one a try, we do have it available now. Again, it's a proven winner um, and plenty, plenty hardy for for our area. All right, uh, next we have Spirea Double Play Dolly. So this again is part of the um, Proven Winners Double Play line. So this is different than anything in the line thus far because it's going to have um, that gold foliage. So it's gonna be kind of similar in that regard to like Big Bang where it comes out with that nice, uh, you know, orange to red tips and then kind of turns more gold as, as uh, the spring goes on. Um, but whereas Big Bang has uh, like a pink, kind of a muted pink flower, this has a nice darker purple flower. So a little more substantial flower color, I would say. Um, and then the form on this one is going to be smaller. So um, if you have a really tight space, more compact, this is going to get, you know, 18 inches, maybe up to 30 inches or so, but definitely on the smaller side for some of those double-placed spirea. Um, 
keeps a really nice form, nice compact plant. You know, you don't have to do deadheading or, or pruning or anything like the old sticky ones. Um, so just a nice kind of plant and forget plant for the, for the landscape. Um, and this one we have available now. And as a reminder, we did discontinue all of the old varieties of spirea. So we did go full into the PW uh, spirea line, which really they are better performers. They We have seen better survivability, better performance in the landscape. We have a spirea trial garden that's actually a media garden. So it's pretty, it's a pretty tough location and these perform the best. So that is why we made the decision to move away from gold mounds, um, neon, carpet all, all the old versions we're not we're not doing anymore so yeah several of those were having issues with disease seeding all kinds of stuff so these yeah. are definitely improved on that regard too yeah all right i think this is the last shrub uh wigilia another kind of old fashioned shrub i would say uh but this is also one that we had planted in our trial garden and it really wowed us uh the foliage color, the flower color, the form, is just really, really nice plants. Um, and again, I feel like we're just like hot on this variegation trend right now. <laughs> but um, so this plant is going to have white um, variegation on the leaves and the edges get this like pinky purpley color, which is why they called it kind of that purple effect. The plant itself, even when it's not in flower, kind of glows this, this purple color. Very, very pretty. Um, Spirea, or excuse me, Wigilia, if you guys have planted some of the older varieties, can look pretty gross after a while. Their form is just wild. Uh, these stayed really nicely mounded. We weren't seeing like dieback. Um, we weren't having to like prune them constantly to make them look like nice little um, compact shrubs. So very nice form on the plant. Very pretty flower color. Um, and and we have a note here, tidier and slightly larger than my Monet, if you guys have tried that. My Monet was a nice plant too, but maybe not quite as vigorous. Um, this one tends to be a bit more vigorous. So um, we have this one available now too. We'll have it in the spring. Definitely recommend uh, trying it out. We've been pretty impressed with this one. So um, we are going to do another poll because we'd like to know which shrubs excited you the most. And again, this is multiple choice. While you guys are voting, I want to remind everybody, um, so with plant additions, with that comes plant sub subtraction. So we, we we do, sometimes we add things that we feel like are improved varieties and, and we just have to switch up the product line. So there is a flyer on the website um, that goes through all the plants that we're actually dropping for 2024. Some still have availability. So if they're your favorites, you can grab some while they're here, but once they're gone, they're gone. Um, but on that flyer, we give you guys recommendations on replacements going forward or maybe why we decided to drop the plant. So I want to make sure you guys are all aware of that. Um, and then I just wanted to throw a quick uh, word of encouragement out there to please follow us on Instagram. Shannon and I do garden walks or production walks, uh, you know, at least every couple of weeks. And we want to give you guys the information on what we're seeing out there, the good, the bad, the ugly. Um, so we want to share our experiences with you throughout the season. And um, like Jamie mentioned, if you want to kind of brush up on any other subjects that we've given talks on, that's all on YouTube. So you can subscribe, follow us um, and watch for that content. So Let's see what shrubs people liked. Ooh, the rhododendrons. That's exciting. Yeah, rhododendron and eclipse. I guess I think I yeah. think that's gonna be, you know, I'm sure they're gonna work on one that is more reblooming because that's always yeah. what they do. But you know, it that is, you know, potentially a game changer type plant. So yeah. Well, thank you guys so much for coming today. If you guys are going to be at iLandscape in a week, um, make sure to stop by the booth. Shannon and I will be around the show. We'd love to talk plants with you and hear your experiences with either these new plants or other plants that we carry. Um, you guys really drive what decisions we're making on the product line and your feedback's really valuable to us. So thank you so much. We appreciate your time and have a great rest of your Friday. Thank you.